Hi, gang. Hey, Hi, gang. How are you? How's everybody? I'm the only one that can hear you, by the way. Shane's okay. just saying hello. He's waving, he's waving it in. I am talking to Matt O'Keefe right now. How are you? You're um, in California. You're a, you're a Boston guy. Is that where you're from? I am. I am. Born and raised. Went to uh, high school. Yeah, you know, grew up elementary school, high school, and university there. I went to Boston College, so I've awesome. never left. So you're a total mass hole, aren't you? Uh, oh, in the <laughs> in the greatest way. I promise you, I am full mass hole for sure. Um, Title. We call it. We call it Title Town, where where I'm from. You know, it's just the Patriots, Red Sox, yeah. Celtics. And, you and, know? and you beat my <laughs> you beat my college last week by one point. Where'd you go? I went to University of Pittsburgh. Oh, no way. There you go. Cool. Yeah, yeah I actually played them. I played uh, football in college, so we played against them. What, uh, what, both Big East and ACC. So. What, what year did you play? I was at BC from 95 to 99. So did you play with Gary Goleman? Uh, yeah, around the same time. Yeah, I know who he is. Yeah, yeah. he's a buddy of mine. Uh, oh, very cool. What, what, what year were you at university? Uh, so I was young. I, I'm... I'm older but uh i'm a comedian stand-up comedian and gary uh you know i performed with gary for the last 25 oh, years oh yeah. Yeah, yeah okay okay cool yeah, that's yeah. awesome yeah it was funny there you go gary Gary's yeah very- tell me about you so you're you're a, you're a comedian what, how did you end up in you know with a crazy crossfit podcast as a comedian uh it's a it's a long story and my fans are probably like god do we have to go through this again um <laughs> i uh but just to, to let you know uh, because i love talking about myself i i i was a sprinter in college and uh got out of college and wanted to stay in shape started doing triathlons I uh, thought I'd meet some hot chicks. You don't because you're on a bike for like six hours and then you're running for four hours and you don't meet anyone. And then uh, I just liked staying in shape all the time. And uh, I was an ocean lifeguard yeah. and did like kind of weird like CrossFit-esque workouts when I was uh, I was a Jersey Shore lifeguard. And uh, the uh, my my cousin was a Navy SEAL. And I said, what kind of workouts do you do? I want to be fit like you. And he said, go to this sealfit.com thing. So I went to oh, it. Oh, cool. And I started following Mark Devine's page. And when he wouldn't post, he would say, go to crossfit.com for the workout. So I started doing crossfit.com. And I was wor- doing it on my own and out of like Gold's Gym in Venice. And one day I was on the road. And uh, I don't know if you know Kenny Kane, who's the owner of... Uh, Oak Park Fitness, which was the former LA uh, CrossFit LA. I don't. I don't. But... Kenny, Kenny's great coach, great coach. And uh, he said to me, he's a comedian and he was opening for me and he said, Oh, yeah, you do CrossFit. I said, He goes, You know, there's gyms for that. And I go, Bullshit. And he's like, Yeah, there's gyms for that. So uh, I ended up going and t- t- first CrossFit LA, then stumbled upon uh, Paradiso CrossFit. And that was like, Geez, it's like 12 years ago now. Oh, that's awesome. And so I've been, do- I've been doing this podcast for about nine years. And well, I've definitely heard of it. I've, ne- I've, uh, I've obviously never met you, yeah. um, but that's, that's, uh, that's very cool. Well, good for you. And how, and you've been a comedian in 25 years, 20, this September, it was 25 years. Yeah. Oh, wow, good for you. Yeah. But I've had almost a year off now. Yeah. It's been the weirdest, weirdest. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what to do with myself. I'm like performing to my family. My wife's like, you're not funny. You're killing me. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. It's been a strange year for sure, but yeah, hopefully we're on, we're hopefully we're on the backside of it. Well, it's kind of cool. You guys are, so you're out in California with, uh, who are your athletes there? Matt and Tia? Yeah. We're, we're, um, we came out, they came out Sunday. Uh, I, I got here Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday. Uh, just for like a little uh, pre-training camp, uh, pre-games camp, just leading in, just to get organized, kind of get away from people, because everybody has to test into the you know the CrossFit hub bub or whatever it is, the bubble. But uh, you know, we um, just chilling in a, in a winery here in uh, Soledad, California, relaxing, working out a little bit, tapering, getting ready for next week. Has uh, have you had to have the Q-tip shoved up your nose yet? No, that's uh, um, Monday. I've had probably 20 COVID tests <laughs> at least, but they've all been like blood, uh, saliva. You know, I've had every format except the Q-tip. I figured I'd save that for Monday when I arrive at the 
games now. New exciting experience with the CrossFit Games. Okay. Uh, somehow your sound is going in and out. Maybe your finger is going over the, the microphone or something, but you go. Like, uh, you, you maybe st- I should stop. Sorry about that. Uh, is that better if I stand, if I'm right here? That's perfect. Um, okay. Cool. So, so you've had 25 COVID tests. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's one of these things where it's like, where, you know, when I go to, I, I spent a, like a decent amount of time in Tennessee during, um, you know, from March to August, you know, I would go down and see Matt and Tia chill out with, you know, Shane and Sammy. It was, uh, you know, it was an easy getaway. They, they're sort of in a bubble down there. Right. Uh, but when I would come in, um, I would, you know, take a rapid test um, just to yeah. be sure, you know, especially leading up to the games. Because, listen, like in the end, the biggest, you know, I guess fear these guys would have is not, you know, Necess- I mean, obviously, everybody's afraid of the, maybe the health risk, but more so the ability to compete or not. Like, sure. if you have COVID, uh, they've worked their ass off. They're ready, yeah. um, so ready. And then they walk in and they're like, I feel fine, but you have COVID, so you can't be here. That would really suck. So we're just trying to be really cautious with it. Yeah, I mean, if you look at some of the famous athletes that have gotten it, uh, Ronaldo, soccer player, just got it. Um, oh, yeah, I didn't I didn't hear that, actually. Yeah, he just, he just got it. Um I, early in the year, do you remember when Clemson, when like the whole football team got it? There, yeah. there was a yeah. rumor. There was a rumor that those guys tried to get it because I'm they, sure. I'm sure they did. You know, you heard the uh, the interview with the the coach at LSU, who just like casually was like, "Well, my whole team's had it. Like, what's the big deal? We're, we're good." <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, it's like it's pretty fun. I, it's such an interesting thing. Like, I mean watching it sort of be handled so differently in different parts of the country. Cause I've, I've traveled not a lot. I usually go to Miami every week. That's where my office is. I have gone once since March, but even, you know, you go down there like, Hey, college football game has 20,000 people at the game. Like you go to uh, this with the sporting events in my town, Boston, there's nobody right. Yeah. Dallas Cowboys had 30,000 people at their game last week. You know, it's just so interesting to s- see our country, act as like 50 independent countries or something yeah, like yeah. this it's crazy i, I drove i drove across country twice well like over and back with my whole family uh just because we felt like it was safer than flying and I, i've got a i've got a one-year-old and just knew he would touch everything on the plane and uh yeah you know saliva every i was just like i'm not going on a plane with him he can't wear a mask this is just stupid so we drove and uh it was amazing, state by state, like just Colorado to Utah. Colorado, everyone's masked up. There's signs. They're yelling at people coming in the door. You go into Utah, it's like, am I in New Zealand right now? Because nobody <laughs> has a mask on. Nobody cares. It was just, it was ridiculous. And uh, I don't know, because like you said, there's a stadium full of people or you know, the Sturgis event in South Dakota or North Dakota. And then you get like the president has a, uh, you know, a little gathering on the lawn where they've all been tested and yet everybody gets it. It is crazy. You know, it's like, you know, I'm a big sports fan, you know, not even, not just involved in sport. And uh, I've kind of like watched it. And again, we run a bunch of events with our business too. So I've tried to like observe even find pockets where like, you know, cause I know our community is resilient or would want to be in a gathering probably sooner than most. And, uh, just like you mentioned North Dakota and I'm a big golf fan and have some friends that play and, and most tournaments are like lockdown bubbles. Mm-hmm. And then they had a tournament in North Dakota and it was no masks and 20 to 30,000 people a day. You know, it's just, it's crazy. It's, uh, it's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, Cookville, for instance, like I've spent a lot of time in Cookville leading up to the games. I always spend a lot of time in Cookville. Matt and Sammy and T and Shane are there, and you wouldn't know there was anything going on in Cookville. Um, <laughs> I drove through Cookville. I, I, I drove through there on my way across the country because my in-laws live in uh, Charlotte. And it was so funny because I told uh, Hinshaw and Rory, I go, I, I didn't want to like – I didn't know I was in Cookville. I swear to God, I just looked down at the map as I'm driving and I'm on 40, I guess. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm in Cookville. And I had told, uh, I had joked with Froning all the time that I was going to come by and want to work out at the, at the barn. And I got my whole family in the car and I'm like, I'm not calling anyone. I'm here. And I was like, Holy shit. I'm like so randomly in Cookville. 
And, uh, uh, so I text Hinshaw after I left and he's like, I can't believe you didn't stop by and say hi. And I was like, it was just too weird right. that I just looked at the <laughs> map and I'm like, Oh my God, this little town that the only way I know it is from CrossFit. And uh, yeah. we just happened to drive through it. Such a, yeah. It's such a unique spot, honestly, like this oddly odd fitness metropolis, you know, it's uh yeah, uh, it, it, the Hinshaws live right across the street from Sammy and Matt, actually. So we, we do spend a fair amount of time with them when we're down there. Good, good people. It's, That's uh, great. It's Did a, you head to Massachusetts? Uh, no, I, I haven't been to Massachusetts in a while. I, I played, I think it was in February, I played uh, Laugh Boston. So. Uh, oh, cool, cool. Yeah. Have you ever done um, the pizza place? Uh, it's like a Giggles. Uh, no, um, Giggle, Giggles was like, when I was coming up, Giggles was like... Uh, Boston has its own comedy scene. It's a famous, famous yeah. comedy scene, uh, you know, with like Steve Sweeney and all those, yeah. all those old guys. And they never left Boston. They made a fortune living there. Don Gavin, Steve Sweeney, yeah. and they never had to leave. You know, Dennis Leary was there for a while, and uh, what's his name? Stephen Wright came out. And probably, probably, other than New York, the greatest comedy city in America. Better than Chicago. Better than L.A. Uh, Boston cool. has put out so many, so many great comedians and so many went to Emerson. Uh, and Oh, really? Oh, yeah. cool. Emerson, I didn't know that. Yeah. Em Emerson has some kind of like entertainment school. Uh, they do. It's uh, communications, entertainment, broadcast. Like, I think there's a lot of, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's them in Syracuse. Syracuse has the Newhouse School and Emerson, Newhouse, yeah. And Emerson yeah. has that. And, yeah. uh, so just so many comedians. I think Orny Adams went to school there. Uh, Greg Fitzsimmons went to BU. Gary Goldman went to BC. It's just this this crazy, crazy. So we don't uh, we don't talk about BU around here. So. <laughs> you know, my the only thing that we, we we say it sucks to BU. That's about it. <laughs> my my old roommate in New York when I first started stand up comedy in '96. My old roommate scored the winning goal in the bean pot for Boston College. Oh no! Who was it? Uh, Mike McCarthy. I lived oh, with. Oh, I know. Oh, you're kidding! That, that's my time. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Be, uh, I believe so. Right? Yeah, he'd, yeah, like, yeah. He'd be so, around like four, four, like early forties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not early. He'd be. Uh, what year would he have been? Ninety six. Probably graduated yeah, ninety six. Yeah, because yeah, I I would have been there for sure. Yeah, we had some great hockey years when I was there. Like that was about the beginning of it. Like ninety six, they lost in the final of the, the Frozen Four. Jerry, who is the really good guy, went pro. Jerry, yep. Jerry uh, stayed with us for a little bit. I, so I lived with three guys from Boston College in New York, and oh, uh, wow. my 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 best friend from high school growing up uh, went to BC. A guy named John Yamokus, and uh, we we uh, they they were all finance guys, and I was just their idiot friend that was being a comedian that they had to buy drinks for all the time. And, That's awesome. Uh, yeah, and we'd go out at night, and they would tell girls that this is my friend Eddie. He's trying to be a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, why, why don't you why don't you just tell him I'm a eunuch? Like, what? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> like, if they when the Upper East Side in New York, where every girl's trying to you know gold dig her way into a house in Connecticut, and they're like going, "Hey, this is our friend. He has no money, none, zero. He's a charity case. You want to buy him a drink? He'll tell you a joke." And, uh, <laughs> so quickly after that year, I moved down to the West village to get away from them. I mean, they're all still my great friends, but, uh, that's great. Yeah. But, uh, what, what position did you play at BC? So, uh, I started as a kicker. Funny enough, I walked on as a kicker and then I ended up doing a motley of things, special teams, running back, uh, tight end. Uh, so yeah, so, I was a, I was a walk on. I was, I was, I was basically a, a punching. Bag. I was just going to say uh, they beat you up. Yeah. I was, a, I was a tackling dummy and then moved on to some baseball while I was there. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was, it was an, it was a, it was a great learning experience. I wouldn't take it back. It was, um, but I did not play football in high school, which was the ironic. That's piece. were you a soccer player? I was. Yeah. And you just were and, really good at kicking. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And athletic and just you know it was it's funny like i think everybody that you know kick, like, was a soccer player you know can set, like goes to a division one school got nothing going on they're like yeah maybe i'll be a kicker and kind of you know 
you know, you walk out there and there's, you know, 12 of you are kicking tryouts and that quickly morphed into, oh, you got some speed and you're a big guy. Why don't you play a different position? I was like, yeah, what out, what out, what out? sure, why not? You know, so it seemed like a good idea at the time. Then I told my parents and they were like, mm, you're going to do what? Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> I remember uh, I was at track practice one day and we had on my track team, James G- or not James Jett, I ran against James Jett. Uh, uh, Anthony Dorsett, Tony Sun, uh, yeah, Jay, yeah, Jay, right. Jay, Jay Jones ran, Dietrich Gels. All these guys went NFL, and they were all sprinters on my team. And one day, Johnny Majors came down to tra- uh, track practice and said, hey, guys, you know, we're low in numbers. Uh, anybody want to come out for the team? And, uh, you know, he's, like, watching practice. He's like, you're fast. You should come out. And, and I was like, no, no, I shouldn't. No, I should never. And he's like, no, no, you, you know, and I go, I, I got my bell rung in high school. Like yeah. these guys are going a thousand times faster, a thousand times scarier. There's n- I'd been on the field during a football game, like a college game and listening to like the impact and the, the carnage collisions. that I saw. I was like, <laughs> there's no way that I'm putting my body into that. And I knew what I was going to be. Cause when I was really like when I, I played high school football and they put me cause I was so fast, I'd return kicks and punts and it was just the beatings that I got were, I, I wouldn't wish them on anyone. Like I hear guys talk about concussions. I'm like, I think I had three a day. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, it, it, the, that was the, the, you know, it's funny. I, I, I can like literally remember the each second, my, my first like real experience with it. We, I, I started in the spring of my freshman year and, we practice, you do like 15 practices, you do a lot of winter training and then, you know, they give you your helmet and pads <laughs> and first time I put them on, but no, we were scrimmaging late in the season and I was a running back at the time. We had like all American running back, Mike cloud, Omari Walker, you know, gained 1500 yards this senior year. We had like really good players that played in the NFL, some linemen, we had a free safety Daryl Dar- Porter who played in the NFL, uh, you know, his cousins were savage uh, free safeties for the Seahawks and the Bills. Uh, and I remember, you know, my first play, I like broke through the line. I was like, wow, look at this. I'm like, doing what? And, like I, wo- I woke I woke up on my back and Daryl standing over me. He's like, hey, man, you got you to keep you got to keep your head up. And yeah. I'm like, oh, yes. <laughs> Night in the hospital. And uh, that was the beginning of my college football career. It's it is. um it's crazy. It's like, I mean, you know, people who played high school football and not college, um, I don't, you know, I get to watch high school football, the speed of the college game. Is it's like ridiculous. Scary. It's yeah, ridiculous yeah. because, uh, you know, I had the speed. I didn't have the ability to catch the ball or once I had the ball, I, I was okay if I had the ball with me, but these guys, nobody, everybody sees the tackles. They see the tackles and they go, Oh, that's bad. What they don't yeah. see are the five yard chucks down the field where just like a cornerback hits a wide receiver or a linebacker hits, you know, somebody and they headbutt them and you don't see, but like a a headbutt, even with those two helmets on it, 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 you see stars sometimes or your head starts ringing. And I, you know, that was from my high school experience. So when I like my father-in-law played NFL and uh, I look at him all the time, like, are you, are you there? Are you there right now? <laughs> like <laughs> it is, it's great. That game is so. I mean, the the athletes. I mean, the evolution. I mean, you're you've got two hundred and sixty pound guys running four five forties. It's like, it's um the the kickoffs are the big problem, right? You know, you get you know fifty yard head start, full speed, you know, plowing into people. It's uh, it is it is such a violent game. It's crazy. It, I mean, I love it. Watched it, watching it. I love playing it, but it's um yeah. So I blocking drills, blocking drills weren't fun. The, the, the biggest thing in college that you learn is how to chop block as a running back, uh, but you, you're not allowed to chop block in practice because they're your players, yeah. you know, your, your teammates. Chop blocking, but I never really got a chance to chop block because I didn't, I couldn't really block. So <laughs> <laughs> when you can't take on a, a 250 pound linebacker head on, you don't get the chance to get in the game to chop block. I just, I just remember when I was a sophomore, I was, yeah, I had some speed and they said, Hey, uh, you know, I'm practicing with the varsity and they go, Hey, you know, we're going to have you start returning punts. And, uh, I was like, okay, so practice, they send me down there. And I just remember the first day, you know, they're like that punt just went so far in the air 
And I remember my coach saying to me something like, he called me Edith instead of Eddie. He goes, Edith, Edith, I don't want to see a fair catch. You catch that ball. You catch. And I just could hear, it's like a stampede trampling at me. And all I'm thinking is, no fair catch, no fair catch. I got to catch this ball. And it's like you said, you just wake up. You wake up on the ground. You, you're looking right. up at the sky and you're like, what just happened to me? Like how yeah. that was the most painful thing. And I don't know how guys do it. I don't know how they continue to do it. Uh, it's, it's beyond me. It's, it's brutal. It's crazy. It is crazy. We were having a conversation last night around the dinner table about it. Just uh, the helmet. And well, you know, do we, you know, the Australians were asking if, Hey, why don't you just take the helmets off of them? Which by the way, from an outsider's view, it's like the easy logical, like, Hey, if you just take the helmets off, it's like rugby and they won't use their heads as weapons. It's like, yeah, it is getting crazy. Yeah. But the problem is you've had an entire culture taught to use their heads. And all of a sudden you take the helmets off because the Australians are taught not to use their heads. Like this is how you tackle and you don't use your head ever. So these American guys are just going to use their heads and they're all going to be dead. So I think it's just helmet technology. Like I just got a, a new mountain bike helmet. Troy Lee design sent me this helmet It is unbelievable. When you crash it, it, it kind of spins on your head. It's got this thing called MIPS that it helmets. A lot of times if you crash, it stays solid to your head and jerks your neck, but this lets the helmet slide so that your neck doesn't jerk. And it's just incredible. Really? Incredible. Yeah. It's like such cool stuff. And I think with like everything that we have now that they'll eventually figure out how to like, you know, cradle that, cradle your head like an egg and it just doesn't get smashed and hopefully less and less concussions. I mean, my father-in-law played seven years, I think in the NFL and he, he played with the, the Eagles mostly. And then the Detroit lions and, oh, wow. and his, he, he goes to all the NFL like concussion stuff. Like they'll test him yeah. for like two days straight and he's pretty good still. Like he's, uh, he's 65 years old, I think. And he's got it going on and he's a successful businessman. And he told me, uh, and I don't want to talk for him. I feel bad saying this, uh, cause there's a lot of people out there suffering from it, but it just, maybe, maybe this is more of my interpretation of it. And from what I got from him and what I've seen of a lot of guys that the guys that stay active and are really like went on from the NFL to other things and are working and, and doing things that they're maybe it's just them like exercising their brain a lot more that yeah. they haven't had the issues that say a guy who kind of goes into retirement and just lays back and goes fishing every day. And the next thing you know, you know, he's got this crate. So I think there is something to that, but I just had a buddy, um, a pro surfer who actually Matt and Tia know, uh, Albie layer. He did some oh, con- country cool. music thing with them. Oh, cool, cool. I'm not familiar with him, but yeah. Oh, okay. He, did, right, he yeah. did He did. some award show, and he texts me. He's like, hey, don't you CrossFit? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, I'm doing this award show with uh, Matt Fraser and Tia Claire. T-. And I go, yeah, they're just like the best in the world. <laughs> he was like, yeah. and he's, he's arguably one of the best big wave surfers in the world and uh, also one of the best aerialists. And he goes, yeah, like they're good. I go, you're meeting – the fittest man and the fittest woman in the world. And he's like, I don't know what to talk about. <laughs> he, goes, <laughs> he goes, but apparently they love country music. So we'll all talk country music. Uh, they do. Uh, yeah. They're friendly with, um, Kip Moore, uh, who is a, I don't know if you're familiar with Kip, but Kip's a guy who loves fitness and, um, has become friendly with Matt and Tia. So they spent some time actually funny enough during, COVID, uh, Kip has a, a climbing ranch in Kentucky that they went and spent a few weeks just to get away. Uh, oh, cool. So, yeah, they, uh, they're, they're huge Kip fans, um, and Matt loves country music. So. Did you say a climbing ranch? He does, yeah. It's a, it's in, a, like, a, a, a gorge area in um, Kentucky that's, like, world-renowned, apparently. And uh, he and a buddy, you know, built this, you know, cabin that sleeps like 30 people and, you know, climbers from around the world go and stay and, and climb there. That sounds uh, amazing. That is so cool. Yeah. So those guys, yeah, Matt and Tia took up climbing in, in, uh, during COVID and quarantine. They went in quarantine there and, and learned to climb with Kip. Yeah, and, such, uh, such. Pro- they're probably really good at it, too. 
because they're so I'm strong. sure. Yeah. I mean, annoyingly, they're good at everything. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. It's like Matt, like I, we, we joke, you know, I love golf. I've golfed most of my life and Matt's like refused to take up golf, but I have this like sneaking premonition that Matt will secretly learn to golf and become very good and then play with me the first time. And I'll be extremely annoyed at how well he does with it. Well, uh, who was it? Uh, uh, Rogan told me once about um, Musashi or something, some famous swordsman that wrote these books. And he said, if you can be excellent at one thing, you can be excellent at everything. And uh, it's just, it's frustrating. Cause like I, you see Kelly Slater, who's like, you know, the arguably the not our, he is the best surfer of all time. He's also practically right. a scratch handicap golfer. He can play guitar with, yeah. with like Eddie Vedder. He gets on stage with Pearl Jam and plays. <laughs> Apparently, ping pong, he will crush everybody. Like ping pong, he's just like ridiculous. And uh, he was working out at Deuce Gym, which is a CrossFit gym out here, because he's good friends with Sal Masekela and yeah, um, yeah. And my buddy's a former pro baseball player, and he said something about beating Kelly, and Kelly was like, "What? What? You wanna?" You want, you want to go like, like he's so competitive that he was like, I'll play you in baseball. <laughs> like, like I, I didn't know. So Sal, Sal Masekela is a CrossFitter. Yeah. Sal loves CrossFit. Yeah. Uh, Sal works out. I, at yeah, du- I, he's been on the I show many times. Um, oh, that's very cool. Yeah. Back in the day, it was funny. I, I tried to put Sal with uh, the guys over at CrossFit media and I said, Hey, you know, Sal's doing CrossFit. He loves it. He's uh He's really into it and, uh, you know, could probably help you guys out. You know, he's also a reporter for ESPN. So you guys are going on ESPN. It seems like a really good match. And uh, there was a uh, box out. <laughs> there That's was. really interesting. He'd be phenomenal. Oh, I know. That's, I, I'm, a big, I'm a big fan. I mean, I've watched a lot of just sport in general, but action sports. And, and obviously, he's the face of that. That's um, that's really cool. I didn't know that. Good. Yeah. I learned something new every day. Yeah, Sal is a great, great guy. Sal's the guy who introduced me to the, you know, I'm a big fan of surfing. And he kind of brought me into the surfing world. And uh, I, it's just nice. I got to meet all these pro surfers. You know how it is. Like, you're sitting there working out with the, you know, the best CrossFitters in the world. And I, luckily, because of, you know, my connection with comedy and everything, I get to parlay that into Last week I went surfing with the big wave champ of the world and it's just, it's the coolest thing in the entire world. Surfing is, we did, we did, we go to Kauai generally every year for this uh, trail run. Oh yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I'm going to do it. So I got I to do that trail run. You got, it is honestly, it's, it's, uh, it like the, the trip in general, like warms your soul. It's like, you know, really, you know, and a lot of people I maybe don't get it through social is about, you know, this, this guy, Aaron Hoff who's a tremendous human um, is trying his hardest to just keep kids off the street in Kauai because there's not a lot to keep them entertained. And it's a big, you know, culture of drugs and alcohol abuse there. And um, he built this program for kids, CrossFit. He feeds them. So he basically picks kids up after school, brings them to the gym, um, CrossFit Poipu, and they feed them a meal and then drop them off late enough at night that there's, it's time to go to bed Um, for 400 kids. He's like just doing great things. And that run supports the foundation, um, you know, that, that handles that, you know, the the program for the kids all year. So we go and do the run, help raise some money. And then we get to try our hand at surfing, which is one of the more humbling couple of days of my year every year. Oh yeah. (laughs) It's crazy. So, so when you say we go, who goes with you? It's literally, um, I mean, Matt has gone, Tia has gone, um, I mean, God, like any, like, nope. uh, Noah's done uh, it. Noah, uh, Laura Horvath, Cody Mooney, um, Carl Webb, you know, Ramwad is a huge supporter of, of the foundation. So most Ramwad athletes, Patrick Vellner, um, they make their way over there uh, and others like you've seen rich there. Jason Kalipa goes every year. Jason's a huge supporter. Yeah, Matt Chan, uh, so. Matt Chan told me he did it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've always wanted to do it. I, I ran a, I'm an idiot, you know, Hunter McIntyre. Um, I know Hunter. Well, yes. Hunter, Hunter talked to me. Hunter's like a neighbor of mine and um, a good friend. And he's on the show too, too much, too much. <laughs> um, I I feel like this is the Hunter McIntyre show because half the time it's we're too, doing half the time we're too doing much of Hunter is 
too much of a hunter is not good for anyone. You have no idea. You have no idea. I could do an entire show. I, my wife goes, why do you always have these people in your life? And I'm like, I don't know. Cause I'm not an idiot anymore. So I need an idiot to make fun of constantly. And, um, yeah, see the scar on my nose. He broke my nose with a surfboard one day. Um, he's, he's just an idiot. Uh, but he talked me into running a 68 mile race. So wow, that's a, uh, that's a, that's a big, yeah, that's a big number. Here's the best part. He told me I didn't need to train for it. <laughs> oh, that's, that's some good advice. He said, cause I was going out on these runs and he's like, you're overtraining, you're overtraining. You don't need to train like that. You're strong enough to do this. Don't, don't train. And I was like, no, you're full of shit. You know, like I don't trust you. And, uh, I'm glad I didn't listen to him and I did train for it, but, uh, <laughs> he's just an idiot. And, uh, so I always like to do these weird things like a 68 mile ride. Like I'm going to do I'm trying to do the bear man, uh, iron man, which is over in France. Yeah. And, uh, it's supposedly like the second hardest iron man there is. It's not really an iron man, but it's iron man distance. And, uh, but the Kauai, if you, if you go do it, are they going to do it again this year? Or so they they did it um, they did it virtually, uh, so they weren't able to assemble right. this year because it's usually post CrossFit Games in September. Uh-huh. Um, so they they did a virtual run uh, to fundraise, and then uh, they'll be back next year for sure. Um, we we, tr- we we love going over there. Everybody will be back. It's. Uh, by the way, you, t- you put on um, the list of like dangerous, like I've heard uh, cool accomplishments. It, it, it is like I did it my the first year with my wife. It's really funny who doesn't get to travel with me a whole lot. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, we'll do this 10K, you know, just we'll just graze and it's raising money for the kids. I mean, I spent more time on my ass than That's I did what I've on heard. my feet. I've heard it's in, like brutal, clawing like red. Hawaiian clay out of all you know crevasse, <laughs> all my crevices for like six months after you know you shower like two months later and it's like the drain's red and you're like wow it's crazy yeah it's um it's I, heard, so fun. I, that's, heard, I heard I heard it's rough it's a unique uh well Aaron gets a little crazy but and it's funny like you run the, the trail run and these kids like seven eight ten years old or running by you barefoot like you're standing still um and and like just crushing the trail yeah and you're barely able to keep footing and you know you've got like cleats on and you know it's uh it's interesting but um, such I, a quiet 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 a, 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 people haven't been such an amazing place i, I really haven't cool. been and my good friends the paradiso's own paradiso crossfit over there and, oh, okay, cool. And I think that's down in, where's the airport? What's that called? Lanai? Is that Lanai? Uh, Lahui. 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 That's where their CrossFit yeah. is. Um, and I, I got to go over there and do that. But I spent a lot of time in Hawaii. And uh, I was there. Uh, the last time I was there, I was doing a show, and these guys were heckling me. And I thought they were of the, the, the gang, the North Shore gang, Dahui. So I was... N- T- usually I'll hammer a heckler and I was like, I, I think I'm just going to let these guys have their way with me because uh, it's like being in prison, you know, like I'm on this Island. I can't get off this Island. They run the Island. I'm not fucking with them. And you want, uh, you want to steer clear of that. <laughs> so after the show, uh, the, one of the guys comes up to me and I kind of suss him out and I'm like, he's got on a big belt buckle and he's, uh, and he's like a little guy flannel. And I'm like, this isn't a surfer. This is uh and I go, Dude, I go, just, I go, you guys, uh, blah, blah. he's like, we're ranchers. And I go, you're ranchers? And I was like, oh, I thought you were Dehui. He's like, no, nah, man, we're not Dehui. And I was like, oh, okay, well, uh, why are you heckling me, dude? You were ruined. He's like, oh, I'm a big fan. I go, you ruined my show. He's like, oh, I was trying to help you. That's what they always say. And I'm like, oh, you didn't. Yeah. And uh, he's like, yeah, I heard you on Joe Rogan. I was so excited you came to Hawaii. And, uh, and I said, ah, and he goes, and my wife's standing there with me. He goes, hey, you want to go pig hunting with us tomorrow? And I go, no. And my wife goes, yeah, he wants to go. <laughs> my wife's like, you need material. You got to go. So, uh, so, uh, I don't want to build up this big store. I didn't go, but they, I said, because the one guy got drunk and, uh, couldn't pick us up the next day. 
But oh, I was I, I asked him, I go, so what's this pig hunt all about? He goes, oh, we're going to go up into the mountains. He goes, it's re-, he goes, can you ride a horse? I said, yeah, I can ride a horse. He goes, I really ride. He goes, we go up these steep, steep mountains. And I was like, uh, I, don't, I don't know. He goes, you'll be okay. And he goes, and we take these dogs, these Dogo Argentinos, who I think Castro has one. And uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah, he does. Yeah. So yeah. they're special pig hunting dogs. And oh, okay. and he said, we we find the pigs and then the dogs will take them down. One will grab the tail, one will grab the snout, and they just take it to the ground. I go, and then you just let the dogs kill them? He goes, no. Then we jump off the horses and it's a race to see who can stab it first. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I want to go. <laughs> and my wife's like, you're going. <laughs> It's crazy. You know, we went on a pig hunt. Uh, Matt and myself went with. Um, so the game warden for Kauai is a good friend, of Aaron Hoffs. And it's a big problem on the island for crops uh, in general. So they have to er- like they call it eradication. I think they're just having fun. But they uh, they do good stuff. With they they bring the meat to like homeless shelters. And, That's great. But uh, And there's nothing better we were- than boar meat. It's so good. Yeah, we were in the back of a pickup with rifles, um, and uh, but shooting. Yeah, it was really interesting. It was one of these ones where Matt looked at me and he's like, "I shoot first. If I miss, you get a shot." He doesn't miss. So. Uh, but yeah, they they do often go and do it that way, um, where they they uh, they use an, a you know a buck knife and, and that's how they hunt. But we did not do that. We we, we went with Chris Hinshaw. Actually, it was myself, Matt. Hinshaw. I cannot see Hinshaw shooting an animal. We didn't get a whole lot of shots in with uh, with Matt with Matt on the on the truck. It was you know Matt Matt took for a lot of the first shots. And they he, were, he's they were he's like a mountain man, isn't he? From like New Hampshire or something up in the mountains. He's from Vermont. Yeah, and Vermont. he's uh you know um you know range shooting is is like one of his if not favorite pastimes. Um, so he's a uh, you know he's a you know he's becoming an outdoorsman too as, as a piece of that. He's uh, he loves uh, target shooting, and so he's really good at it. That sounds like I have a neighbor who is a. Uh, I live up in the mountains above Malibu, and uh, lot, tons of coyotes, and they're a problem. But you're not allowed to kill them or anything. And we had one when I first moved in that ate our neighbor's dog. Two, two just ripped our neighbor's dog in half in front of my pregnant wife. My wife was like screaming, watching this happen. So. Uh, I contacted a couple neighbors. I was like, what do we do about this? Fireman said to me, he's like, if it was me, he goes, he goes, don't do it. He goes, if you do it, your neighbors are going to tell on you. He's like, they'll act like they're your friends, but they'll tell on you. He goes, if it was me, I'd shoot hard and fast. And he goes, and have a, <laughs> have a hole already dug. And he goes, and you bury that thing and you don't let anyone know you ever did it. And I was like, all right, calm down, fucking Scarface. And um, <laughs> so then, then my other neighbor goes, you want me to come down? I'll take care of it. He goes, have you heard about me? And I, I just moved in. I'm like, no. He's like, I'm known in the neighborhood. And I go, what, what, what for? He goes, I killed two coyotes with one shot. <laughs> oh, wow. There you go. And I go, what? He goes, yeah, there's a coyote in my backyard. I line it up in my sights. He's like, I'm going to take it out. And he goes, all of a sudden, I see another coyote. And I go, just wait. And he goes, I just waited till it walked behind it and boom, two of them, one shot. And I'm like, Oh, you psycho. Oh, geez. Then, I talk to, then I talked to another neighbor and he goes, yeah, you could kill him. He goes, D- just bury it when you're done. He goes, I, I skinned one once and hung up its hide on our fence and some neighbors got mad. <laughs> 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 the, the 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 worst part you know i was kind of glad i didn't get a pig that that evening because the 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 process is you shoot it you got it so oh. i watched that pro- yeah i watched that part of it and i was like you know what i'm okay with this yeah i'm okay i i, uh, I, I wouldn't want to gut like i can't even gut a fish i was i was surfing today and the guy next to me uh is surfing with a fishing rod in his mouth riding waves holding a fishing rod in his mouth and then, really? yeah, and then he would go paddle out and, the, you know, there weren't a lot of waves today. So in between sets, he would, you know, just throw some bait out there and try to catch a fish. I'm like, you did this all? And he's like, yeah. He's like, makes the time go faster. I'm like, didn't really need that to go faster. But, um, yeah, so so what what's the day these guys first report to the ranch? So we, we will go, um, we will 
check in Monday. So you can as early as tomorrow, Sunday. So you would, um, the process is you take a test and then you quarantine <clears throat> until your results come back. So we'll get, um, sometime Monday morning, we'll probably take our tests. Cause I'm with Matt on his coaching van and, um, we'll sit in our hotel room until the results. I was come just going to say, then... where are they staying? They're not staying on the ranch. No. So we're out. Um, there's a, there's a town like 30 minutes away, I think called Morgan Hill. Um, that will be in uh, a hotel, uh, right, right there. Um, and I'm assuming we don't know much, but I'm assuming there's some events, you know, at a facility nearby there too, as well. So, um, yeah, we'll be, um, everybody including their staff are in the same hotel so we'll all test in you know they're testing as well so sunday monday and then we check in um you know we check in actually for the games on i think uh sometime wednesday and so we you know we can work out um they'll have like more facilities so we'll work out monday if we're tested in monday tuesday wednesday and it looks like it starts Friday, although we don't know. The schedule seems to be Friday, so we'll probably just be. You're going. You're going in and out again. You were perfect before. Now you're going in and out. Um, uh, Sorry about that. I said, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So let me ask okay. you this: What? Uh, how many? How many events have they released so far? I saw something about a a sack race, a sack race or something, corn sack. Yes. So so far it's three. Um, we we they they announced that they'll do the. Uh, 2007 CrossFit Games, um, you know, in one day. So event one, two, and three look like, um, you know, the first workout was like a thousand meter row, and then five rounds of 25 pull ups and seven shoulder overhead, which is a 2007 Games workout. And then, okay. and then there was a 5K run, which I think is now being replaced with that sack run. That whatever 300, 400 meter run up the hill with the. With oh, the I love that! I love that crazy run that they did. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, that should be interesting. Uh, that hill's steep and longer than it looks. That's what I've heard. Uh, I, I was just talking to Samuel, Samuel Quint. We had him on the show the other day, and he was he's a cross country background, and he's like, "That shit's crazy." <laughs> yeah, that's a different. That's a you know, your legs become bricks quick, and then you know, um, and then the final workout that day, event three, that's been announced is um, the CrossFit Tour, which is with back squat, a strict press, and a deadlift. Oh wow, that's gonna be nice to see. I, I I can't wait to see the giant numbers they're gonna put up on that. Yeah, they did it a few years ago in Madison, so <clears throat> there's definitely some numbers out there. Some of the guys weren't there. Uh, more of the girls were there, but only a couple of the guys. No, and Matt, I believe, were the only two that were at the games two years ago when they did it. But uh, yeah, what I mean, what, did, what what kind of number did they do? Do you have, do you remember? Yeah, I mean Matt back squatted four eighty five <sighs> pressed. Um, uh, like 205 and then deadlifted like 525 um and you know but like so he was, uh, he was up around is that around 1200 yeah uh probably like i think his number was like 1230 about Jesus. i remember because i had a good i had a good deadlift back in the day i could do like 475 and i was like my goal someday would be to do uh to do a 1000 that's that's all i want to do is break a thousand if i can break a thousand I can retire from CrossFit and I, uh, you know, never, I mean, not even close. I don't know what happened or didn't even pursue it, but it's not happening ever again. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. They, it's funny to watch the evolution. I can, I mean, I can't remember when, if, if you were like 500 pound deadlift, um, you know, 400 pound back squat, and, you know, 175 to 200 pound press. Um, those were like the world best numbers you know yep. there was guys who deadlifted 590 back squatted 500 strict press 225 at that game so it was crazy sam dancer who i just had on the show uh this week did like 650 or something on his yeah on his back squat or his, his uh deadlift yeah there's some big boys out there there you know the 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 group of five uh males at least um you won't. You. I don't think you'll see a deadlift that you know up towards that six hundred number out of that group. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, 
and you know i think the back squats will be you know all around that you know 450 to mm-hmm. 500 number and you know it's a it's a pretty you know when it comes to that i think the you know that pure strength test stuff i think they're all very you know they're all in that same ballpark strict press you know somewhere between you know one 190 and 220 um so it'll be that that should be an interesting event i'm interested to see how they do stuff like that like because they have a smaller field will they you know do it like more um as a group instead of like you do three lifts like will they just you know bump the bar by 10 pound increments and every crack at it to, to, to make it more of a show it'll be interesting i'm sure they will the, the, the agility they have comparative to other years is crazy like I, I think it'll be a lot of fun to watch i I, I, I love when they just set up the bars and they've just got them at every increment and it's just like Go ahead, just keep going, just keep bumping up. Yeah. Till you, I remember I did it one time at Raw Athletics in Pittsburgh, which is one of my favorite gyms by Jeremy Tuman owns. You know Jeremy Tuman that played for the Steelers. And oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah he, one day, just we did a workout, and then they had you know you're just gonna go, just go through the bars, lift it, and I think it was a clean and jerk, and just move up to the next one, and move up to the next one, and I PR'd because of that. Because, you know, you're in this row with other people and there's someone behind you and someone ahead of you and people are just dropping out and you're moving up. And I went way over my PR because there was this like kind of like spectator feel like everybody's watching everyone. And I I just like that, that they can step up to, you know, that they don't actually have to go incrementally, but they can just step up to where they think they can get it and boom, pick it up drop it and then move on to the next one. There's no resetting, you know, like uh, taking the weights up, putting the weights on next guy. I just like, I like fast. Boom, 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 go. Let's see them all go. This definitely, that's not a garage workout. That's a good workout with a group for sure. I'm so excited though for this one. I think it's great that it's just five guys and five girls. I, I, I am too. It's, um, I mean, they're really good at running events and, um, so I think, um, you know, and there's, they're seemingly pretty giddy about the numbers because of their ability to do some things differently and be more agile. Um, so CrossFit's always done a really good job with that, with events in general. I would assume it'll be a ton of fun to watch. Um, and it'll be a really cool experience for the athletes. I think it'll be a, a pretty, um, big test too, because that, you know, that small group, um, yeah, I think you'll see this year be probably the biggest year you've seen, you know, in terms of what they put them through. Yeah. In fact, I'm wondering if the way this works, that it might be the new normal that they say, hey, this is how we're going to do it from here on in, because it allows the spectator to get to know the five athletes more than, you know, when there's 45 and you're like, who's this guy? Where did he come from? And uh, there's this Turkish guy named you know, blah, blah, blah. And then this guy from Guam and he's out and now, Hey, you know, like the, who are these people? But all of a sudden, you know, people start paying attention when you get to the five best and I put it on Facebook and Instagram, but I was like, so who do you think's going to come in second? <laughs> because uh, I, uh, you know, great. you're, you're the agent for both of these guys, but we got to be honest. It's uh it's not looking good. I mean, CrossFit, uh, Sean Sweeney said it to me once. He was like, I said, how do you think you can win this year or something? And he didn't say, I don't think I can win. He said, CrossFit is very incremental. Like, you know, it's so measured that you know exactly where you are. So you know how much you can move up and how well, I mean, You never know what can happen. Somebody can have a bad day. Somebody can get sick or somebody can get hurt. Or like Matt, you can drop, you know, you can make a mistake on an event and your thing falls out of your backpack. And, uh, you know, and that throws off your whole thing. But again, there's enough events that he was able to come back and dominate. So unless, you know, you know, Castro's out there programming it to make it like, how can I make Tia and Matt not win this it's it's pretty hard because they dominate and it's gonna be it's it's a competition for who's can get second and i hate to say that because i love noah he's a great guy but sorry (laughs) they're so dominant it's a a, yeah i mean you know and i'm I'm probably most visible you know with shane and sammy to to the work and it's um 
Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I get that. I think it's, you know, less of what we would concentrate on um, is more of, you know, it's more of them just being their best. And, and to me, that's, you know, and I talked a lot about this through phase one where it was a unique competitive platform where, you know, Matt would do a workout and give it his all and kind of then wonder like, geez, I wonder what that score is like. And for me, uh, it was like a very comforting platform because I know being around Matt for the last seven, eight years, when he's at his limit, it's really hard to say that anybody can compete with that, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, you know, you've tossed around some variables that can always be in the mix that can change that, right? You know, injury and yeah. weird, funky stuff. But over the course of, you know, 10 to 14 workouts, I think, it, you know, I mean, I don't know how anybody could say it'd be easy to beat either of those guys, you know? Um, Wait, Hinshaw, Hinshaw made a great point to me one time. You watch the guys that win. You watch Fraser when he wins in the end. You watch Froney when he used to win in the end. He's, you know, they sometimes aren't in the lead coming up to the very end. And he said, yep. it's an endurance sport. And it's how long can you endure it? It's not three events. It's not four. It's four days. And at the fourth day, yep. this is where these guys come on strong and win. And so, you know, they, they just, it's like a race. And at the end of the race is when you got to win the race and they win it. And, uh, and it's because it's so many events, if it was a CrossFit total or one event, maybe not, you know, maybe, not. but because it's 14 events, it's, you're just giving them too many chances to win. Yeah, And it's, it's, um, you know, and obviously I can speak best to Matt on this is just, you know, he's, physically the best um and he's mentally the best i think that's a big component of it which is you know there is you know and it's hard to describe but what what the mental test is through the course of a games year but um you know being able to concentrate on yourself i mean last year was a perfect example of it like you know uh there were a lot of things outside of matt's control and all matt could do essentially you know especially coming into the weekend was put his best out win every event and hope the chips fell the way that he needed them to. Um, you know, and I think you saw last year, Matt, at his best ever mentally. You know, mm -hmm. it's just it required him to not be off for one percent mentally in order to execute what he needed needed to execute because the the, the the cards were sort of stacked against him after the way things shook out the first couple of days. <clears throat> um you know, through the scoring and the 150 athletes. Yeah, yeah. Because I think on paper, if you take the scoring system out, you look at Matt's events through the 10 or 12 events, whatever it was. I mean, he was as dominant as he's ever been, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, um, yeah, he just is so good at concentrating on what he can control and being his best, um, which sounds like it's always such a cliche thing to say annually, but Truly, I, there's nobody I've ever been around that's better than, better at that. Where's uh, that? Where's that? Just, com where's that come from? Does he work on his on his mental attitude? Does he have a coach for that? Does he? Is it just natural? He, you know, it, it is. Some of it's natural, and and he's worked his ass off on that as well. Which mm -hmm. is, you know, recognizing sort of when he's allowed himself to to not um, be his best uh, in his focus mentally, and then correcting that. And, and being prepared better to um, identify it and, and not fall in the trap of anything your mind wants to do to you in, in, in certain scenarios. Yeah. I mean, he works at everything. There isn't a second in a day that um, he's not trying to get better at something. You know, I think he says it a lot, which is, you know, you're either doing something that's bringing you towards your goal or away from it. Um, and he's lived that for the last seven years. It's been a um, pretty um, tunnel focused you know, yeah. lifestyle for the last, you know, seven years, you know, certainly after 15, uh, in not sort of accomplishing what he wanted, he, you know, the switch kind of went off on, on all of it. It's just, you know, I'm going to eat, sleep and drink everything that I need to be my best come August. And, um, yeah, yeah he's, uh, yeah, certainly you need the makeup to be able to accomplish that. Um, but he's just so wise beyond his years. He's a 30 year old kid that, um, you know, has great perspective on more than just what happens on the floor. And I think, you know, he's just, he is, uh, he's a genius. Like when, you know, and I think you could, you know, when people don't get to see it too, is like, um, he's so smart and thoughtful. Um, you know, even his humility plays into it. I think it's just like one of these things in, in, um, 
you know, a lot of people don't get enough exposure to is sure. just, you know, his, his intellect, his intelligence, his application on that side. He's just, uh, he's a unique, hardworking, I mean, I've, I'm 13 years a senior, um, you know, we've been together since the beginning, but he's, uh, I learned a lot from him. He's just got great uh, application and perspective. Uh, you know, and there's a, a lot of people look at sports in general and they're like, ah, oh, gifted. No, that's bullshit. Yep. Um, I, I you know, and, I, and by the way, I played college sports. You're, you've been around a long time. Like you can see that there are the 1%, but there's a lot of them. There's a lot of people that will have a physical genetic makeup that, of a guy like Matt there's just, you know, people, there's not a lot of people like Matt, you know, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, these guys that just get all of it, hundred percent of it. You know? Um, I had, uh, well, the, there's a great book called the talent code that talks a lot about that, about myelin and wrapping, bundling nerve fibers and how people that are people that are excellent at what they do, what they do is they, uh, they correct what they do wrong constantly. So they fail a lot, but they fix it and they, they work on it and they fix it. And, uh, whereas like a regular golfer will have a bad shot and just keep playing the course and just keep playing their game where Tiger Woods will hit that bad shot and then analyze the shot and then fix the shot before he goes on. And in, you know, he's, I mean, he can't do that in a game. But, or a match, but he can do it right there in practice where everybody else would just go, I'm just going to play the whole course where he would go, no, I shanked that shot and I have to figure out why I'm doing that with my six iron and I'm going to fix it. And, uh, these guys like Ryan Flaherty told me, uh, you, you know, Ryan over at Nike, the head of performance, he said there's commonalities between all these great athletes. And he goes, it's amazing how similar they all are They're, you know, they all obsess at what they do. They all think they're the best in the wall world where they're almost arrogant about it, but they have to be. And he said they they want to they're like sponges. They want to take in every single little thing that they can learn to get better constantly. Like even when they're the best in the world, they just want to get better and better and better. And, uh, you know, it's sometimes it's a pain in the ass to be around them. I've got some friends that are pretty elite and it's it's a pain in the ass to be around them because they're so one track mind and kind of can, can sometimes appear selfish, but it's like, that's the price you pay to be the best in the world. And it, it's, it's worth it. You know, it pays off there. There are dividends, but there's, a, there's also, you know, it's, it's a, it's a weird world. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of sacrifice personally. And then those around them. Um, but you know, it's all worth it. It's funny. It's, you know, I think all of us that live in the camp, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's taught me a lot about how, we, you know, the, the pursuit of being the best at what I do, you know, yeah. I, my, my, my ability and in, in execution has gotten exponentially better being around it. We all feed off of each other, but I, I agree. Like, you know, I wouldn't put it as it's tough to be around. It's, it's, um, it's cause I, I mean, maybe I'm just such a geek when it comes to this stuff. I've always studied greatness and been so fascinated by, you know, my favorite thing as a kid was to watch didn't matter what the sport was, but the thrill of victory. Oh, I loved it. You know, you know, and it didn't matter if it was like a surfing championship, the NBA championship or rugby. Like I just, you know, because, you know, what goes into that is, is extraordinary, right? Like it just, especially at that, those levels. So I just, um, you know, the last seven or eight years have been able to be on the inner side of, you know, that and get to watch and be a student, honestly, and, and watch kind of what goes into that. And, Man, I would not like I Sammy and I talk about this often. It's like who knows when this is over, but man, I am like daily identifying how grateful I am to be a part of this and um, you know, really soaking it all in. It's 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 fascinating and it's so much fun. I mean, you you know, this is generational type stuff. It's really interesting because you saw Rich one four. Um, you know, and I truly believe what Matt's accomplished is greater than what anybody's accomplished in this sport, you know, and Tia on the woman's side, it's, um, you know, because the, you know, the ante sort of, it gets up on an annual basis. Um, I'd be, you know, floored if you ever see anything like this again in our sport, it's just, um, it's, you know, it's crazy what's being, what's being accomplished by, by Matt and Tia on the female side. It's, uh, they're yeah, they really are dominating. People. It's, it is going to yeah. be tough. I've talked about the, since day one, you know, I've been doing the show so long. We talked about how younger people will come into the sport as they are. If you look at the top five, you got two young guys in there 
and uh, of the men's and uh, what's her name? Hale, Haley's pretty young too, right? Isn't she? She 19, she's 20, 20, 20, 19, 20. Yeah. I think she's probably just 20. And yeah. I think you're going to see more and more of that just because of their, their bodies being able to handle it a lot more, the growth hormone, the, you know, like the fact that they're grow, you know, their, their body can recover better. And so to see Matt doing this, I mean, 30 still young, but, but to dominate like that for as many years, you look at the NFL, you know, some of those guys, 18, 19, 20, 21, or I'm not, not 18, but I'm just saying like 22 year old kids are playing in the NFL and they're dominate at 22. And it's not many guys that last like a Ben Roethlisberger to like, or, uh, you know, Tom Brady that make it to that age. And those are quarterbacks that are, yeah, they take their hits, but they're protected. So these crossfitters like, like to, to take the body beating that Matt's taken for so long and still remain the best is phenomenal. It's freaky. It's, it's fascinating. It, um, we, we, we talk about this quite a bit. I get asked it a lot. I, I, I have a lot of perspective on sport. Um, what they do day to day is harder than, than anything else. And I think there's, you know, certainly debate around that. I mean, I think an NFL season might be harder physically because of the contact and collision than most things or at UFC fights. But from a day to day basis, like they choose extreme pain at a high volume. Um, you know, it is, you know, your recognition it, of that, you know, their, their ability to stay on top and, you know, stay healthy and clean through that is crazy. Yeah. It, it's, uh, if you got to see what goes into just a day and like the, 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 the edge you need to live on to be that great, it's painful. Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's hard to watch sometimes. It's yeah. like, fuck, you know, like, Jesus, man, like, like, how about we take a couple of days off here? Like, you're good. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. There's no room for error on that. Let mind. me let yeah. me ask you, how much as being around him, how much has it helped your CrossFit? Yeah, it's funny. We we joke about this a lot. Early on, it was like the worst thing that happened to my CrossFit. So when I met Matt, you know, early on, I was, you know, still like part of a gym that wanted a team at regionals and like kind of chasing that competitiveness. Mm-hmm. And I'd work out with Matt and Matt would win by so much that I got like unscared. And I worked out a I worked out a lot with him early on because, you know, I was around him so much and I, you know, the lovable loser, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, Hey, a guy finishes, you know, five minutes ahead of you. You kind of don't use that same speed in finishing. You're just finishing. And like over the course of a year, I was like, wow, I'm getting less. Fit right now. This is strange, <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, working out with the fittest man ever. Right. So um, it's, um, you know, I'm, 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 I've, converted to you know fit for life um and you know i learned a lot you know he's given me a lot of great perspective on how to train smart he's very smart about oh that sure to, he's got a long long term and uh he, he you know he's protective of me and takes care of me but yeah it's like you know we do imams together you know um i'll you know like the other day shane myself hopped in with t and, and matt and it's a very different imam <laughs> than they're doing you know but you know we, we we suffer together so it's still cool and it's like you know if you feel dealt in it's know, all you, it's you know, all, with ran, with crossfit with the scaling it's all relative you know it is like we ran together <clears throat> the other night and you know i you know i you know I look and Shane looks for, you know, how can we push them somehow, even though they're just so far ahead, you know, put a vest on them and, you know, hopefully we can push them without a vest. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, uh, uh, it is so fun. It's really interesting. Like, I don't think, you know, Michael Jordan's agent got to play basketball and practice with him, you know, and I, par- uh, I partied with uh, his agent. I partied with his agent one night. Oh, there you go. Was, well, I don't I, know if he, I don't know if you got to jump in on any bulls practices, but you know, I feel like I get to do that. You know? It's so cool. funny you mentioned him because I was thinking about him when I, uh, I used to work at this, I still do a comedy club in New York city called the comedy cellar. And, uh, yep. it's probably the best club in the whole world. So there's always celebrities in the crowd and afterwards they want to meet the comics. They always want to talk to you. You know, you're famous for 15 minutes. And, uh, one night Michael Jordan's agent comes up and starts talking to me and buddy of mine, Artie Fuqua. And uh, we said, hey, we're going to this nightclub. You want to come with us? And he was an older guy, and we were like young kids. And we're like, come on. So we take him, and I remember the doorman wouldn't let him in. He was good with us, but he was like looking at him, looking him up and down. And he was like, yeah, I don't like his shoes or whatever his excuse was. And Artie is very connected in the nightclub world. He's like, let me go get the manager. So he goes and gets the manager. 
And uh, the manager comes out and tells the bouncer, he's like, let him in right now. You know, like this is Michael Jordan's agent, you know. And I, <laughs> so he lets him in and we go. And I just remember Hardy getting in this big bouncer's face and going ha 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 he's like you didn't let <laughs> you you just tried to deny michael jordan's agent like ah, oh, you idiot you idiot and he just kept giving him a shit and i'm like already you're gonna get beat up right now but it was really really funny and we hung out with him and i was like what's it like you know just being with michael jordan and of course that guy never probably ever played basketball with michael jordan <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it is that is it that is a cool part of our sport, you know. Like surfing, for instance, you know, I'm sure you know the guys that care for Kelly are you know part of the surf culture. They probably get to get in the water with them, you know. It's um, they do I, with I, me. I, I, I get the see. I'm I'm I call myself a shitty surfer. I've been surfing for a long time, but the first time it ever happened, Taj Burrow said to me, who was number two in the world at the time, he's like, "Hey, you want to go out for a surf?" And I was like, "Ah." Uh, Ah, uh, and I was like, no, because I was so scared of like him seeing how much better he was than, and then I got over that. And now I surf with those guys all the time. And it's just like, you just sit out on the shoulder and watch them just rip. And it's, you get a, a view that many people will never, ever get. So, so, you know, you're lucky enough, like, you know, in your lifetime, you got to train with the fittest man in the entire world maybe yeah. ever ever i mean he ever. could go down ever i believe that today you know yeah uh, it's it's uh you know the, the fittest man in history really and it's it's uh yeah i i don't take that for granted i'm so grateful it's really fun yeah we we get you know it is you know once in a great while he'll be like hey will you do this with me and it's like usually like a rowing workout which i'm like pretty good at some of that metabolic stuff with the machines but he uh you know just sitting and suffering with him is enough sometimes and it's uh you know it's amazing i gotta I, I, I gotta tell you honestly my uh my little guilty pleasure i guess it is is just watching tia beat him though when i see her beat him in something it like oh, when, yeah. when she did that i think it, was it a swim run swim or what was it in madison yeah. last year that she beat everyone she she well Tia is the best swimmer in the sport male or female yeah and uh, it doesn't get any like but well she gets credit through her accomplishments but it's not really talked about quite a bit and in uh yeah i get to see them train together on a daily basis um what a what another really next level unique you know situation uh, the two greatest at this sport and like you're saying could be ever right they really go at it day to day and it's um i mean we were running you know recently you know sprint running and and uh they literally were looked at you know shane and they're like hey can we just like go at separate times and he's like why and he's like because we're starting to compete with each other you know it's oh. like they they're literally in a really and it's healthy they identify it you know and obviously there's some things like female version of it might be different than the male and, right right but they go at it and it's so fun to watch they push each other so hard and it's uh they have like this brother sister relationship like he'll yesterday he won a workout and, and and trust me she knew it when he was done you know it's uh it's really fun it's such a cool that's another level of you know again stuff i get to pinch myself on like what our the, the camp you know our camp what we're you know doing now and like what they do on a day-to-day -day basis um Man, if people could get to see that on a daily basis, it's just, you know, greatness at its finest. Well, so she, cool. she, um, I mean, I'm not a male feminist by any means. Like I'm not one of these guys like women are just as good as men. And, uh, but what I do love is when I hear dudes shit on women and go, women can't do this or they can't do this in the military or women can't. And I'm like, let me show you this woman who will beat yeah. you in everything you ever do. And let me tell you, there's a whole bunch of women like her and CrossFit women have proved like you put any of those women in the military, they're going to make it into like special forces. They're going to make, they're badass women that have trained, that have been given the, the okay to do this shit. Like, whereas it, maybe it was shunned upon before, or this isn't your sport. You're going to do gymnastics or you're going to do whatever. And now it's this kind of like brutal, like beat your body type of situation. Not saying gymnastics isn't, but, um, but they're capable, truly, truly capable, strong as fuck now, stronger than Tia's stronger than 
98% of the men in the world. <laughs> I mean, that's, Jeez. I'm just throwing a random number out there, but probably that's probably, I don't know, maybe kind of accurate. That's a well, weird way to often, say something. Quite often when I do, do workouts, I use, you know, the woman's weight. I'll work out with Tia. I'll work out with Catherine. Catherine lives in Boston where I'm from. Right. Um, and I'll get my ass kicked and I'm like, I mean, I'm reasonably fit for a male 43 years old. Um, I can't hang with those guys. Matt, it's, um, Matt, Matt, I tried to do the 60 plus women's division CrossFit last year, the games, the open 60 plus women. And I was like, I'm going to crush all you bitches. I was, and it was like a big joke. <laughs> <laughs> because my whole thing, it's when they were allowing transgenders into the games and blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, I'm going to do it. And if they question me, I'm going to say, how dare you? This is what I identify myself as, as a 60 year, 60 plus woman. And I thought I, I paid, it was the first year I ever paid for the open. Cause I didn't believe in it. I'm like, I'm giving them my $20 just so my name can go at the top of the 60 plus women. It's Eddie Ift. And, uh, the first event I got smoked so badly smoked by like, I came in like at the first day I was in like sixth. I was like, Oh, I'm sixth. I should do it again. So I can be first. Cause I like, I like struggled with the, I'm like, Oh, I can get this. And, uh, by like day six, I was down to 150th and I was like, there's 150 60 year old women fitter than me. And then I, I did Crazy. like, I did four of the five workouts and uh, one of them I won. And it was just because the weight was heavy enough that it was too heavy for the women. And I got to the heaviest weight. It was one of those ones where you keep adding. If you get the time, you keep adding. And it was like yeah. a, a 145. Whatever it was, it was just too heavy for them. And it was like, oh, so only one of them. But like if I could, like I I wasn't even on the, the same, you know, you, you refresh the page, go to page two, page three. Like these women beat my ass. And uh and I was telling the story at CrossFit Malibu and there's a woman there that's a games athlete that uh, 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 is in, you know, the older group, the older masters. And she got like offended that I even thought <laughs> that I could. She's like, what, you thought you could beat us? And I was like, awesome. well, oh, you're talking about you're talking about Gabby. Yeah, yeah, Gabby. Yeah, she was Gabby's a good. Gabby's Gabby's a good friend of mine. Yeah, Gabby yeah. was mad that I thought. <laughs> Oh, it's funny. Oh, I didn't even put two to two and two together. I love Gabby. <laughs> Gabby's a real good person. Yeah. Is she, she, I've worked, I've worked out with Gabby at CrossFit Malvo a few times. So she's, she is very fit. <laughs> yeah. And she did not. And Heather Hippensteel works out there. And yep. uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great gym. And Mike Anderson's one of the best people in the world. He's such a nice guy. The he best. Really is. Yeah. The best. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's um, that's a cool gym. If people ever are in that area, that's the that's a real that's like a must drop in. That's uh, like one of the best old in the world. CrossFit. Yeah, it really is. I love that Kwanzaa hut. Like, really, such a cool place. Yeah, I hope I hope it never changes. I hope that's how it is always. It's it was funny. I took my my daughter does a little bit of CrossFit. She's five, and I drove her in to see it the other day, and uh, they were closed. It was after hours, and my daughter, five years old, looks at. She goes, Dad, can we work out? now because she saw the stuff outside and i'm like no no we can't just jump in and start working out but uh oh, yeah my, mike's awesome and uh uh i had a question for that, you that, that by the way just on that too which is important I, it's one of the things i'm i'm really proudest about with you know one as proud as anything else with crossfit is you know the the, the female side of it and you know especially on the business side you know um females um, are paid equally, you know, and it's, um, you know, you can always see, you know, endorsements, a different beast, you know, females generally do, you know, um, will get endorsed, you know, a lot of times because of look, um, in, in our sport, you know, from an accomplishment perspective, you know, they're equally endorsed as males. And, um, you know, obviously that, 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 that spectrum shifts, you know, when you're looking at, you know, basketball, NBA players are paid way higher than female NBA and our sport, everything's equal. Um, that was, that was really... my, that, funny enough, you said that that was my next question because I had heard that the women endorsement wise do better than the men other than say Matt. Collectively they do. Um, and, and it's, um, it's such a, a point of pride for us. I think it's, uh, it's really cool. 
and all their brands are such great partners and it's very athletic driven. You know, it's not, I, you know, it, it really, it, you know, everything's image driven in terms of mm -hmm. image and that's mm -hmm. collectively not, that's not body. That's like, there's more to it. Um, but you know, they're, um, they're just exemplary human beings that mm -hmm. get endorsed for who they are collectively in the makeup. And, uh, yeah, females are, um, do very well in our sport and, uh, there's no drop off male to female in our sport. Uh, yeah. On the endorsement side, females at a, at a deeper level are endorsed. Um, prize money is the same. No matter, you know, it's like one of the most unique unspoken things. Like you go to an event across the world, that's CrossFit. Every event doesn't matter where it is, what it is, is always equal prize money, male and female. That's, that's not the, that's not that's not the same in, in any other sport. No, you know? no. So it, it's uh, it's really. Uh, I talked to Eric Rosa quite a bit about this, um, the new CrossFit owner, and it, it, it's um, and I think it's just such an area that need. I think people need to see that and, and understand that it's it's uh, it's something that should be uh, celebrated. It's oh, so cool. In surfing, the women get when the waves turn to shit, that's when the men get out of the water and the women get in. They yeah, never get the good crazy. waves. And everybody's like, the women surfing is so substandard to the, to the, or subpar to the men's. And I'm like, well, if they ever got to surf the good waves, maybe you'd see, you know, cause there are some women now that are just phenomenal. I think women are coming up in all sports and it'll just keep getting better and better. Guys, I want you to listen to me when I talk about this because it's like, uh, uh, it's very important. Uh, I say that a lot, but I really mean it right now. I reached out to these guys. Uh, I'm not a smart person at all, but I do care about my health a lot. So um, I've constantly wanted to monitor my health a little bit more than just my general practitioner or my internist or whatever they're called, uh, internal medicine doctor, than they do. I mean, they. I've had blood work done there, and it's just... They don't, when I say, what does this mean? Or what does that mean? They're like, well, you know. And I really, really wanted to get more in depth about things like my magnesium level, my LDLs, my sex binding hormone, my testosterone, my free testosterone, all kinds of stuff like that. And so all of a sudden, somewhere on the internet, I found this company called Inside Tracker. We reached out to them. We partnered with them. And I said, let me, let me do it. Let's see if it works and let's let's get together on this. So uh, I can't tell you how easy it is. You go online, you fill out your name, you fill out your you know address, a little bit of information about yourself. And then they just give you the directions. They're like, okay, you're going to get this in the mail. You're going to get this in the mail. I got a DNA test. All I had to do was just swab the inside of my cheek. Not like those COVID swabs that go up your nose. I just swab the inside of my cheek, put the little thing in a bag, put it in the mailbox, gone. Boom. They came back to me with my, with my uh, biological age. Um, and then they were able to do like genetic testing. Uh, one of the other things they were able to do then, I had to go to a laboratory. So they found me the laboratory online right there. Boom. I go to a lab. It was so easy, especially with COVID. I walk in. I just put my name into a computer and they said, hey, what's your number? Put it, phone number. They go, go sit in your car. We'll text you when you're ready to come have your, uh, to have your test taken. So they said it'll be seven minutes. I sat in the car. Seven minutes later, I get a text. I walk straight in. I go back to this nurse. She ties the thing around my hand, types down my name. Boom. Takes my blood. And uh, I was out of there in like five minutes. Five minutes and then a week later, boom. All my results come back online, right in front of me, telling me all about all of, I think it was 43 different markers and um, so much interesting stuff, but not just that. Um, they give you a plan. They tell you then what you have to do to change things and bring things back into, uh, if, if something's out of line or out of whack, how do you bring it back? What should you be eating? How should you be training? Um, there was one of the things I, I, I talked to the, the, the nurse that they, they put me in or nutritionist that they put me in touch with that you end up, you get to, to do if you sign up for this. And she knew all about CrossFit. She knew that one of my levels was high and it was probably, she goes, did you work out within the last six days? I was like, yeah. She's like, did you do heavy weightlifting? I'm like, yep. She's like, that's why that's that. Um, I was worried about a couple liver things and um, just so informative and so um, 
put me at ease, but it also showed me that there's some things I need to work on. And I wouldn't have known what I needed to work on. I talk on the show about the coconut oil thing and uh, a couple other things, uh, you know, just easy things to change my diet, just, just adjustments to get myself a little bit healthier and make sure I live a long, healthy life and I'm able to take care of uh, these two crazy children that I have. Um, it's just great. So I, I, they're called Inside Tracker. It's an ultra personalized nutrition platform. It analyzes your blood and DNA biomarkers along with your lifestyle habits that you're going to plug in yourself, and uh, it's going to help you, you know, reach your goals. So they've got a patented system that's going to transform your body data into knowledge, uh, and they've got a custom action plan of science-based recommendations. So if you're ready to get involved in this, which I think. Everybody, I always say, if you're a trainer or you're an athlete or just your regular everyday person exercising, no matter who you are, you need to get blood work and you need to get a body scan. You get those two things and then you have metrics to work with. So uh, this is one of those two-pronged things that I say. And uh, it's just so easy to do. Go to InsideTracker.com. InsideTracker.com. They're going to give you 20% off any plan. 20% off with the code WODCAST. W-O-D-C-A-S-T. I say you go all the way. Go all the way. Get the big one. Get it all. Inside tracker.com. 20% off with the plan uh, of any plan. Any plan. With the code WODCAST. All right? Take care of your health. Do it now. Okay, we're back. Um, yeah. Uh, so. There's. Matt's, was, Matt's uh, phone overheated. It's 95 degrees here. Um, oh. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Is it? Is but, it yeah, we were. T- go, go, go on, you go. I said, yeah, I mean, like we were talking about the, the woman side of things. It, it's, uh, I mean, that is uh, something that we all should be super proud of. It's really, you know, you're talking about the surfing thing. It's like, think about that. It's like, oh, the shitty waves are here. Throw the woman in the water. It's like, really? Like, it's 2020 like is that how things work it's just it's kind of crazy what's you know acceptable uh, other places it's not even you know the most interesting part is it's not a top of mind thing for a woman in our sport they just are equal you know and it's not anything that they look at and they're like you know i think you know when they have some chance to step back and you know you know take a second to look at you know you know, a, a 10,000 foot view of what they've accomplished and, you know, what they're involved in, they, you know, look at that, but it, it's, um, it's not like, it's just the way it is. And I, th- it I, th- be, I right? think it was designed that way from the beginning unintentionally, you know, cause everybody gives Glassman a hard time about how he treated women. And, uh, you know, I, I think Glassman had his faults, but I think he was unfairly also criticized for some things that he wasn't, but, uh, but uh, he's probably just like every other person, a flawed individual and done some wrong things. Uh, but you know, one of the things about it is that the sport was set up, granted women do lighter weights and they're, they're, rx is lighter but giving like the fact that a third of crossfit practically is gymnastics all those women are probably going to have that advantage on men so when the sport started and everybody was in the gyms doing it women had this like there were like when i went to my first gym 12 years ago or whatever there were just as many women there as men and the women were doing things uh you know, there was, I remember my, my first CrossFit, first time I ever walked in was Helen and they were like, it's three, four hundreds, you know, 21 kettlebell swings, 12 pull-ups. And I was really good at pull-ups and, uh, and I could run fast and I did it with Kenny Kane, who was a, he was a distance runner. He was a, a middle distance runner and he knew I was a sprinter and they said, go. And I sprinted as fast as I could the first 400. And he goes, there he goes, sprinter, you know, like go, go. And by by the pull-ups, uh, this girl, Gretchen, uh, Gretchen, I, I, oh God, I feel terrible. Gretchen, she was, went to the game. She was a Paradiso CrossFit. Uh, it's her, um, brain fart right Kittle, now. Kittle, Kittleburger? No, Gretchen Holt. Is it Holt? Um, she was a coach at Paradiso. She just starts flying past me in the pull-ups and it was, you know, 12. And I was like, what, how's this girl crushing me? just crushing me my 
And I'm like, I'm no, this, this should not be happening. It wasn't that I wasn't fit or anything, but I didn't gain. And she was just awesome. She was really good. And, and, uh, and I feel like that's how CrossFit from the beginning, it was, and I kind of was against that in the beginning. I went in, I was like, I want to work out with the dudes, you know, like this is what we do. And then we go meet girls at the bar and I walk in the gym and I'm like, why are there all these chicks here? And why are they doing our workout? Girls don't work out with guys. And the girls were doing the same exact workout. And Martina Paradiso was badass as fuck. You know, like she's she's running the gym with her husband and she's doing every single thing and crushing everyone. And I was just like, wow, this is uh, this is weird. I didn't know there were women like this. And now you see thousands and thousands and thousands of them, you know, everywhere. So it is great. It's great that the sport has done that. It's, uh, you know, it's great for it. Like I have a daughter and I tell her every single day, I've, I've never let her think that boys can be any better than her in anything and that she can't do anything that they can't do. And I've just raised her like that. I'm like, you're, you know, she's like, oh, that boy's faster than me. I'm like, I'll bet you can beat him. <laughs> like, you know, keep practicing. I bet, I'll bet you'll beat him. And, uh, That's great. and she, she points this one kid in her class. She's like, he's the only one that can beat me. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, it is. It's uh, it's promising for just uh, you know, how we apply it on that side, right? You know, to our children. You know, yeah. I have a daughter for fourteen years old, and you know, her heroes are you know Tia and Katrin. That's you great. Know? I'm I'm pretty okay with that. Yeah. You know, um, that that's uh, you know, you know that they, they you know take an interest in her, and she looks up to her. Like I I can't think of. Uh, better role models you know and it's um yeah it, we're lucky we're fortunate you know they are really you know i think that's like you know always that age-old sport debate is you know the whole like i'm an athlete uh i don't want to be or you know charles barkley you know i don't want to be a role model um they are you know people look up to them it's yep. a responsibility that you know is inherent with their with their work and um we have some really you know amazing role models male and female um you know that i, I want my kids to to emulate and, well and they're they're such hard workers they're so disciplined and uh something about it usually bring the, I, i've interviewed enough people in this but i've done this is like the 450th episode of the show and I've i met, finally made i finally made it <laughs> well i wanted you on a long time ago um it's uh i didn't used to book the show uh but what what I found is that the, I've probably in 450 episodes only met a few assholes and I come from the comedy business where everyone's an asshole. You know, it's full of <laughs> it, they're mental cases. Awesome. They're mental. I tell yeah. everyone, I'm like, I love comedians to talk with the best conversations you'll ever have could be with comedians. Cause they're so well rounded and knowledgeable on so many different subjects and analytical and the way they think it, they, they look at something and then, because we can't tell a joke about what everyone else is going to joke about. We got to like look under it, look around it, look over it. And so comedians are great to talk to, but I'd never want to be in a foxhole with one ever. I'd want to be in a foxhole with a CrossFitter. I would trust them. They'd have my back. I know we'd get out of there. They would fight for me. They would die for me. They would help me. They would carry me. Uh, a comedian would shoot you put on the other uniform and run the other way. I mean, like they're just, they're, they're pieces of shit. <laughs> and I'm saying that oh. lovingly because I do love all the comedians, but I just know they're, they're, they're faults and they've got thousands and they're all in therapy and they're all psychopaths. And, and it's just, it's just the crazy uh, world. That's amazing. I have a, I have a cousin who's, who, ch you know, was chasing the, comedic dream for years he lives out there um I, it's, you probably don't know him greg tuttle is his name but he he's lived in that la area forever but he's uh well, i love him he is a unique character though yeah. i'll tell you so i've had some you know some insider exposure to that yeah it's it's a weird weird world i mean they all act tough you know but they will cry like a baby and, uh, you know, they, yeah. everything offends them and everything, you know, they act like, I don't care. I'm fucking this guy. And then, <laughs> uh, um, so I, uh, I had a question. I've taken way too much of your time, but I want to, uh, two questions. I want to get into that. I, this is just, I've wondered this L did late in live come after you started agenting or were you with late in live before that prior to that L L live, live, loud and live, loud and live. Yeah, yeah. Late, late in live is a show in Scotland that I've done. <laughs> 
fine. It's um because it's newer to the space. Uh, yeah, that was a um. So I I started first is the okay. answer to that, and and uh, on my own I was um an independent um and you know funny enough Matt's fiance Sammy worked with me. Um, so, you know, I got busy and needed some help and Sammy came on. So we did that together for years. And I, mer- um, you know, I merged with Loud and Live in 2018. Okay. They had bought water. They had bought Wadapalooza mm-hmm. and, um, we're, uh, they're entertainment guys, uh, my two partners and, uh, they lived in the entertainment and marketing world. They, they do a lot of general market marketing work, work um, you know, with Walmart, McDonald's, mm-hmm. some, some mm-hmm. big brands and, um, they manage music talent and run a lot of concert tours and they, they just saw this event their event guys and they were like Phew, that is amazing you know i, I want to be a part of that they bought it and quickly realized they knew nothing about the culture and community and um so we met uh we were introduced by the prior owners and um you know they had wanted to sort of start some something in sports and that you know my dream has been to you know continue to expand and run in sports and and um you know, they were, they believed in that. And so that's how I ended up there in, in Miami in 2018. So with that, uh, what I wonder is how much of your time is spent representing the clients that you have and how much is spent, uh, nurturing the, the, the games and the, the competitions. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's interesting. It depends, you know, really, um, you know, my, my role has become, you know, more 10,000 foot w- with every day, right? Because it's, you know, we do a lot at this point. Uh, we have, you know, three major silos. We, we do marketing work for brands that, you know, will put sport budget you know, in, 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 you know, sport marketing budgets out there. And, you know, so we work, uh, we have clients, agency or record clients that we do marketing work for, uh, you know, either activation or digital. Um, and we represent, you know, a pool of athletes who um, are sort of who I am at my core um, and who we are, you know, we're an athlete first business and we have five major CrossFit events uh, that were sanctionals, you know, we'll see what kind of they're part of the seasons moving forward. But yeah, I mean, honestly, when I first came on there, uh, you know, Sammy took a lot of the burden. Um, you know, she came with me of, you know, the day to day with athletes, um, you know, because I really needed to become, you know, help move uh, Wadapalooza in a different right, you know, direction from where it was and expand that business side. So yeah, it, it varies. Like right now, it's all, you know, it's very heavy. There's not a lot of event stuff going on, very heavy athletes. The mm-hmm. big thing is, is I'm very connected day to day to all of it. Um, I have really cool people on my team that might handle a lot of the day to day. But, um, you know, I have about 12 to 14 hours of Zooms a day and, and I stay very connected. But, yeah, I'm, uh, you know, um, the athlete piece of what I do is is truly my passion. So it's um, something I'm, I, you know, I gravitate towards on a daily basis. You, you, just, you, you, know. you seem more like, so I don't understand your business that well. I, 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 I the only kind of idea I have is I have an agent and I have a manager. Um, my yep. agent procures my work. My manager manages my career and, uh, my agents, uh, like my, you seem more like a manager to me. My manager We're is a little bit, of, my manager's yeah, a bit with both. me. My manager does sometimes shit that my agent should be doing. And my right. manager <laughs> like looks out for me. My one manager said to me one time, he said, a manager is just an agent with a soul. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, agents have a lot of clients where managers just have like what you have, like a stable that, and you can right. really give them attention because my agent can't, you know, I call him. He's like, who's this? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it is interesting. Uh, that's great. Um, that's a great observation. It, it, we, we kind of do both, right. It's, um, you know, we, you know, I have people that are sort of whatever junior agents or people made junior managers, but you know, I'm very managerial with certain people, you know, me, you know, day to day, um, you know, with a smaller group, but we have a lot of people that we would be what you would call an agent to as well, which is, you know, right. a little more transactional, a little more, you know, you know, just, you know, supporting their business side of things, not like their travel or right. how they, you know, how they help in competition. You know, we help everybody we can in competition. Like we'll, you know, set up things that, you know, runners and services we can to, to, to assist, but yeah, you're right. Dead on. Like we, you know, we kind of fill both roles depending on who the client is. Yeah. Sounds, uh, sounds like, just like know. what I have. Cause my, my manager will do 
negotiate my deals and, and, and make connections and give me advice. And then his assistants will do my travel and his assistants will, will handle my, like, you know, talk to me when I'm having a, you know, tantrum or, <laughs> you know, like they don't have to do the, 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 they do the shit work and he does the, the glamorous stuff. But, uh, you know, the one thing I know about it, cause I just, I've been in this business for so long and watching, I've had so many different managers and from the biggest names to like nobody, you know, to like my best friend. And what I know is in comedy, like I said, we're all mental cases. Like seriously, it's like, it's like psychotherapy where I think you're dealing with, you know, some really professional people that are very, that you don't have to do any of that bullshit. You just have to make a money and, uh, you know, there's not the hand holding that you would have with a comedian. Like, yeah. You know what, you know what I would say though, is like, you know, for, they're not, they're not, you know, I think great people who are great at what they do are um, very similar in a lot of ways, especially on the talent side. You know, I, I don't have a client that I dislike. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, and I think there's probably a lot more of that in entertainment and sports than, than I see. Like, you know, we, we just wouldn't work with somebody mm -hmm. unless we we really believed in them as a person as well. But they, um, you know, when you're chasing greatness or, you know, um, your performance matters at such a high level like that. And that's sort of your role or your job. Um, you know, you, you know, people get uncomfortable. There's fear, there's doubt, there's insecurity. So, you know, um, I, I, I thrive in that. Like I really, you know, that's where I think, you know, our role, um, where we can play that one and two or 3% is, you know, helping support that, create confidence, uh, instill confidence. Uh, but, you know, I don't run away from that. Like, I don't think that's, uh, something, I think there's probably more of that than you think, you know, yeah, they were like, by the way, super level headed and easy to work with, but you know, um, there's, there's discomfort around, you know, yeah. being on a pedestal and, and, you know, having to perform once a year for, you know, what, yeah. where you sort of sit in the ecosystem. Right. So that's uncomfortable. So and, I think it's, uh, you deal with it. And I've never seen a sport that thrived through social media more than CrossFit. I mean, maybe action sports a little bit, but, uh, you know, I had to deal with when I started in comedy, it was getting on TV, getting on TV, getting on TV. It was all about what TV shows you could get on Letterman or the tonight show or do this show or to comedy central, your half hour special, your hour special, your this, that. And then all of a sudden social media came in and it was like, what are your numbers? What are your numbers? What are your numbers? And it was all these metrics of your numbers. And I've seen it in CrossFit because they have this niche fame that is like, gigantic it's crazy it's all the yeah. same people are following all the same people it's not like this broad like the whole world you know like if i went down the street and asked um uh you know if i asked any member of my family who matt frazier is not one of them would know who he is but every yeah. single person that does crossfit in the world knows who matt frazier is and that's millions of people so like he has this like crazy level of fame in this world and it's yep. got to be it's got to be uh very heavy on those guys and very uh you know because as fame wanes or what happens i mean like because there's a difference between success and winning and also fame and like you know we saw it with hunter when hunter got himself into the games i saw a lot of guys get really mad at him because yep. Hunter was stealing their fame and it was like, who's this guy? He hasn't earned his way in. He, yep. he talked his way in and now he's getting all this fame. And I saw them start to lose their minds. Like there was this like, yep. who is this fucking guy and why? And you know, you saw it a lot with the women with Christmas Abbott. Who's this girl that can't even, you know, she couldn't compete. She wouldn't come in the top thousand, you know, like, and she's, constantly talked about her numbers are crazy and so you know i would think that's the one place where these guys would go a little bonkers over they do they do <clears throat> you know they sort of wear their heart on their sleeve when it comes to that you know it's um yeah i think you know hunter was polarizing for that reason i think it was you know guys that 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 you know that's their craft and they work really hard to get there right. on an annual basis and somebody 
did a you know a PR campaign and got in, uh, you know, a lot of people took that personally um, because you know they know what it meant to get there and they could never get there any other way, right? Right. Uh, you know, and and, um, and I think you know the result of that was you know that you know I mean good on Hunter for being there, but like he got chewed up and spit out. You know, I don't think he belongs there, right? From a athletic perspective, you know, maybe he'll work at it and get there the right way at some point. Um, but, um, you know, I get it from there. You know, I see that, you know, I, I understand that because it's, you know, and it's the same with followings. Like, I think you talk about, you know, social influence opposed to, you know, an athlete. Um, I think a lot of it, um, you know, that is, that is personal for them too. Cause it's, you know, I think, um, every follower to them is like, you know, a blackout work in a workout, you know, brought them there, you know, it's like, you know, I, and they wear that on their sleeve, right, wrong or indifferent, you know, it's like one of those things where it's like, you know, that's their badge. It's like, I, that's, you know, you see 2.2 million followers for Matt, that's blood, sweat and tears to him. Like, yeah. you know, um, you know, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. So, you know, the, the, what I've seen too, which is really fascinating, particularly with Matt is the more, uh, general recognition of him of late you know matt's gone on a uso tour with you know sean white you know sean white and he are mm-hmm. friends um but you know the 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 uso recognition you know of, of him being on something like that um a lot of um athletes in other sports especially through his nike relationship gain him recognition i i have a really great story about that where uh, nike had an anniversary celebration on campus there were like ten thousand people running around they brought a bunch of like really big name athletes olympic gold medalists nfl stars to you know do a skit on stage or speak i didn't really know what he was getting into i had planned it and um it was literally the same time the whole colin kaepernick thing was dropping so colin kaepernick was the most focused athlete in the world right Right. nike stock dropped 20 percent. they were doing that whole marketing campaign and colin kaepernick was there and, um, you know, Matt had perspective on Colin Kaepernick because of through the media, he was like, wow, this guy is probably the most famous guy in sport right now. Mm-hmm. Like there's nothing else being focused on than him. Colin Kaepernick came off the stage and Matt just was like going to casually walk by him to go do his set on stage. And Colin stopped him and said, Matt Fraser and, <laughs> and Matt like could have still like knocked him over with a feather. And he was like, Colin Kaepernick. And he was like, you, I am a huge fan of you. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and he was like, what? He's like, dude, I watch everything I can on you. You know, you're <laughs> incredible at what you do. And this guy just like, Matt was like dumbfounded, but like went on and on about how great Matt was. And we get that perspective a lot of times from Nike, like Rory McIlroy is a huge fan of Matt. Um, you know, I got some time to, to spend some time with his agent at one point. And he's like, dude, he loves Matt get them together it's cool that that's now happening right it's like a little more um you know it's like i always make the you know and by the way i'm not saying matt's tony hawk or you know uh but like but he is he, no but he is in his own way he's the best at what he does and and people that dabble in it will identify with him i mean i saw it shane um what's his name uh two two top pros sir kelly slater was talking with um shane um Oh, why can't I remember Shane's name? But Shane is a, uh, he's a really good CrossFitter. Shane, oh, why, why can't I remember Shane's name? Uh, one of the best big wave surfers in the world. And they were, I saw them talking on Twitter and, uh, and Kelly was dabbling in CrossFit a little and Shane did it a lot. And uh, Shane said, I just did Helen or did Fran or something. Or, and Kelly said, what's your, what was your time? And he told him and Kelly wrote back, who are you rich froning? And, uh, and it was just, you know, here are guys that cool. in a totally different sport identify, like talking about these guys that like, you know, they don't know these guys and, but y- you are the best, you know, it's your, you know, you're the, the, the Emerson Fittipaldi or you're the, you know, when you're the best at what you do, you are going to be identified. And when I said like that, no one in my family would know him, no one in my family could name probably the, the secretary of state right now, you know, like they you know they know the president right, right, right. they know yeah. and so no, I get it. you know like poor noah olson is not getting uh kaepernick's probably All not right. mentioning <laughs> no i know it's a, it, it is it is cool though it's like well, i make that tony hawk analogy because I, and i say that because i know who tony hawk is i couldn't name another i can name paul rodriguez but like you can't like i couldn't name another sir uh, skateboarder right right 
and it's like guys in niche sports transcending the sport and recognizing their greatness. I, I, I don't hate it, but I, I relate it to Joey Chestnut. Like everybody knows who Joey Chestnut yeah. is. He ate a lot of hot dogs 10 years in a row. 62. Like nobody, no, nobody knows anything about hot dog. Like, but when you get to that level, you know, people start to recognize it is cool <laughs> to see them get some recognition on that side. But yeah, it's, um, can't believe you brought up wild. Joey Chestnut. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, I know. Sorry. Edit that version up. That no, he suck, beat. Yeah. He beat. What, what, what's the Asian guy's name uh, that he beats all the time? Kobayashi. 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 Yeah, I used to have a joke about Joey Chestnuts. It's great. Yeah. You know, only in America. Only in America. There are people starving all over the world. All over the world. And what do we do to celebrate our Fourth of July, our independence? We eat enough hot dogs that the whole like they could feed an entire community in Africa, and then just like. And- puke them in 10 up minutes yeah I, I think weirdly i think it's 12 minutes i know because we oh, did it? i don't know why it's the random number and i think his his old record was 62 and i made my interns do it on my podcast one time these two big fat guys they said they could break it with just the bu- with no bun they did it just hot dogs and uh i put them in a baby pool full of hot dogs and uh and uh just to throw a little spice in it I made them watch gay porn while they did it. And, <laughs> and it was uh, one of the greatest episodes of the uh, Talking Shit podcast in history. I don't know if you can you know, find that one on the internet, but it would probably. I'll have to, I'll, I got a day today that I can do that. I'll, I'll find that. That's Pro- um... Probably keep me out of, uh, that would probably keep me out of uh, network TV. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, oh, I know hot dog eating. I have a friend from high school that was on the circuit, so I like uniquely engaged it, at, you know, early on. But so it's, weird, uh, such yeah. a weird, weird, weird. Well, yeah, well, hitting. look, I, 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 I think what you're doing is great. I love that uh, these guys are getting the recognition they deserve. I hope more and more athletes start making more and more money so that it draws more people to the competition side of it that like people like me can't do, but I love to watch. Um, and, uh, you know, like, what is it? High tides, you know, rising, rising tides, raise all rising t- Yeah. And I believe that. And I think it can only, I'd like to see this, this, uh, CrossFit, you know, like with Eric taking over, I want to see it thrive and uh you know more people listen to this show and i i love it i think it's great i can't wait to watch this is the first year i'm really really looking forward to the games i love the idea of it being at the ranch i uh i liked it back in the day i liked it like early on and i didn't like it when it started getting like madison and but i like the cool gritty like off you know off the beaten path kind of thing i i want to see them do weird stuff so make well, sure what I, I, I can edit. I was going to say, I appreciate you, you, uh, you having me. It's great to connect with you. Of, of, uh, I'm a fan of what you're doing and, and I uh, appreciate being a part of it. And, and I, um, uh, I'd love to connect sometime. I, I think, uh, you should make sure next Wadapalooza, you put it on your calendar and come do some podcasting from there, but we'd love to have you. You know what? Uh, I've never been, if you've never been, I'd love, I'd love you to come I, on. Out I, I was going to go down with idiot Hunter last time. And, uh, I, I, I don't work in Miami a lot. They used to have a comedy, an improv there that I would work. And one of the things I tried, what was it? Maybe two or three years ago. I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Madison. I'm going to go to the games. I'll do a bunch of interviews and then I'll do shows at comedy on main in Madison, which is a really nice comedy club there. And I couldn't sell a ticket. I was like, hold on. I sell out like in other cities. I can't get any, I had like four CrossFitters there. And I'm like, why can't I sell tickets at, uh, you know, this show? And it was like, because they don't want to leave the CrossFit world and go into the comedy. Where, you know, they want to be somewhere with everybody else working out and talking, working out. So I, I've always tried to find a way to mix the two, but haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> well, we'll do it. We'll do it. Wadapalooza is this, you know, carnival of fitness and and activation you come and uh we'll set it up we get, maybe we maybe, maybe we could i have done a couple shows at gyms and they're pretty fun uh so uh maybe we maybe we, we could set do up we set up a podcast stage like right in the melting pot of the quad and you know there's thousands of people a day there and we'll you know let anybody use it podcast um you know whatever they want to do but we'll get you up there and you can just roast fans and, as they come by and the oldest podcast in the history of crossfit was not there 
How did I? Yeah, I, did... Uh, we need to fix it. We need to fix that. Absolutely. Well, we have a Cal- we, we have a California event as well. We we own and operate the West Coast Classic. That oh, was awesome. supposed to be in March. So, but anyway, yeah, I'd love to. Let's stay in touch. Well, I appreciate and, you doing uh, the show. You um, and uh, where can they find you? They, uh, you know, Loud Loud Live Sports uh, is our business handle um, you on Instagram, and, and and O'Keefe MR is my handle on Instagram. Um, but yeah, I mean, those, you know, those are the best places I think to, to find us. Uh, Water, you know, we have all our individual event handles, which people are really familiar with. But you know, Loud Live, Loud Live Sports. At Loud Life Sports or at O'Keefe MR. Well, th- thanks so much for doing the show. I really appreciate you taking all this time. I, 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 I abused you. I had you on here for a long time. I'm sorry. I know you got a lot to do. And uh, just no, for, no, we're good. Just give your prediction. Good. Who's gonna Who's gonna win the games? Yeah, I mean, um, I believe Matt is gonna win the male, and <laughs> Tia the female. I really went out on a limb there. So. I think Ve- I think Vegas is taking the odds, and it's like uh, if I bet a hundred bucks on Matt, I think I'll win about twelve cents. <laughs> it's uh, four hundred fifty dollars to win a hundred. Is it what? Is that what it is? Is that what it is? Yeah, uh, four, yeah it's minus four fifty. Yeah, so I had a feel. Uh, I had a feeling it was, and they are taking the bet in Vegas. Uh, yeah, I, it, it looks like a you know Caribbean you know online thing. Uh, honestly, at this point, yeah. I don't know if Vegas has it on, has it on the board at MGM or anything like that. I'd be. I don't know. They they take it everywhere. They take a bet. Um, um, yeah, right, you know, but Dave Castro posted uh, some betting site yesterday on his Instagram story that had the odds on the males and the females. Hysterical, hysterical. Yeah. So, yeah. Wait, wait, Castro. <laughs> He should not be posting that. That's like insider trading. That's like Castro. I think it, he could fix the whole thing and make himself retire on this. I think it was more of like, like I, I get what like maybe the outsider view would be on that. I think it was more of him like, wow, like we're getting recognized. Yeah. And I don't think that was, you know, <laughs> you know, I think that was sort of, I get it. But I think that was sort of why he posted. He was like, wow, like there's lines on our athletes now. Like that's a big step, you know? Um, yeah. Now, now I'm going to call so. Castro Pete Rose from now on. <laughs> we drove by. I'll finish with this. We were out uh, getting a swim in yesterday and we were in the vicinity of, of Aromas. So we're like, shit, we'll drive by. And, um, you know, like just speed by and kind of like look at what's going on over there. And <laughs> see if we can see was- anything in the yard. <laughs> truly yeah. and we drive and I, I mean i'm pretty you know easy to pick out and and uh we drive by and sure enough dave walked out of the barn um uh, and it looked it looked at me and kind of like waved and tia was like froze and like waved at him like hi dave you know <laughs> i get this text message he's like he's like i think i just saw a car ride by with you in it so we drove back and, and said hi but yeah it was supposed to be a drive-by but we got caught look at you being you're you're, you're a belichick you've learned from the best <laughs> <laughs> that's right you know no stone unturned right that's how we would look at it in new england it's not it's not cheating it's just you know doing our job all right well i want to talk to you one second off the air but uh thanks everybody for listening check out our uh you know right. go to our patreon go to itunes rate review comment and uh thanks for listening thanks matt o'keefe for being on the show and uh uh check Thank out the games right. and check out um uh his instagram and all that stuff thanks good night goodbye whatever your name is whoever you are wherever you're listening and i am ending this okay stop here